unmuted. Hi everyone, my name is Megan Brotherton from the Australian Safe Communities Foundation and along with Tanya Peters from Safe Communities Foundation New Zealand, we are your hosts for this webinar. Before we start, there's just a couple of uh, housekeeping matters. We have two great presenters today who will have around 15 minutes each for their presentations and if time permits, we'll have a couple of questions after each presentation. You will have access to the GoToWebinar control panel on your screen. Please familiarise yourself with its features. If you're having any problems, please send a message to the organisers by the control panel and we'll endeavour to resolve the issue. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentations, please type your question in the question area on the control panel or you may wish to put up your hand. So to put up your hand, you need to click the yellow hand on the control panel. If your question isn't answered, the presenters will provide an email address at the end of their sessions for you to correspond with them personally. The webinar will be recorded and available for viewing early next week. I'd now like to introduce our first presenter for today, Paul Johnson from Safer Communities, Marlborough. Are we ready to go? Hello everybody, I hope that uh, everybody can hear me. Um, I'm Paul Johnson from uh, Safer Communities. Safer Communities is part of the Mall District. Hello everybody, um, I'm Paul Johnson. I'm from Safer Communities, which is part of Marlborough District Council. Um, doing a presentation today about um, our SEPTED Street Intensive Program. Just want to start by showing um, a little TV clip that was made when we were doing one of our projects uh, a couple of years ago. Lenin, not the place you'd expect to be setting a national trend. You'd need a local to point you in the direction of Stratford Street, a street crying out for some TLC. I'll hang in here a few times. I deal with um, all sorts of issues. A place undergoing a transformation thanks to a Ministry of Justice funded initiative that's so successful, police headquarters have templated the idea. There have been various attempts to boost street projects around the country, none to this scale. Oh, damn. The first street project that we did, which was 2008 on Lucas Street, compared with a, a three year average prior to the project, there was a great huge drop in, in crime that occurred. A drop of 41% to be precise. We've still got around a 21% lower crime rate in that area all these years after that project. So it definitely works. But the cost, around $25,000, is a 400% return on money spent. Stratford Street should eventually look like neighbouring Brewer Street, itself cleaned up six months ago. Who were people turning up and down here? Yeah, there's now there's, there's more of a, um, I guess people are looking out for each other more. When we first moved in five years ago, there were families in the street that as a result of them being in the street there was a lot of crime and they're still in the street? No, they've moved out. Is that because of the clean up? Um, I think they're probably part and parcel. The job is so big, it'll take five days to clean up Stratford Street. He's taken three of those trailer trucks completely full, like over the top full, um, out already, two on Thursday and one out yesterday of rubbish. Not green rubbish, rubbish. Is that going okay? One common denominator in all these cleanups. There's 30 and 38, I've got a whole lot of green waste. Passionate, Paul Johnson. We'll get about this one and we'll come back and do it later. How much green waste are you expected to clear? Normally we clear between 70 and 90 cubic metres. The big trailer with the high pull sticker on it, um, we jump on them as hard as we can to fill them and there will be 35 of, it's normally in the 30s, um, trailer loads below. We have this little policy where we don't particularly 
uh, take a great deal of interest in a household if, um, if they're just going to sit back and have a beer and watch us work. But if they do stuff that helps us to help them, then that's about you know them engaging in the project and taking ownership of it, and we're, we're more than happy to help them. But this is more than an inordinately big, inorganic rubbish collection. Because all this was hedge, all the way down there, but that stuff over there, it was just all down there. And it's been got that chin and that dog over there next door is just got the very barking. So I've asked how they've done many times for vectors, and it's taken them 10 years to get it. But this isn't Housing New Zealand. Yeah, it's, no, it's not Housing New Zealand, no. Paul sort of defence, he found the volunteers. Actually, pretty much everyone you see doesn't live here. But I'm going to for, for, for the um, street, even the house is working for nothing. So, why? Because it's good to see the community getting in and, and um, doing the thing and all getting in and helping. So what would you be doing on Saturday morning? Uh, generally asleep. Or PlayStation. What we want to do is build community. We want people to get to know each other, work, work together, um, and um, end up with a uh, situation of uh, people know each other and people care for each other. Right? So there's a little taste of, uh, of what actually happens um, during the clean-up part of the, the project. Um, the Street Intensive Program is a seven-day program, not a, a five-day program, as they said. And um, there's a whole range of activities. People get confused that it is just a clean-up, but uh, for us the clean-up is only the vehicle to, to do a whole lot of other things. Um, it's, it's second generation, uh, SEPT, that uh, we are doing. Um, what I want to do now is just kind of go through and talk about a little bit of the stuff behind it. So uh, what do we know? We know that uh, Ministry of Justice, New Zealand, uh, Ministry of Justice statistics say that 5% of New Zealanders are the victims of 55% of the crime in New Zealand. What that tells us is that uh, crime happens in pockets. Um, we also know from police information that uh, a whole lot of, uh, of victims are offenders and offenders are victims. We know that uh, there tends to be less crime um, in a neighbourhood when neighbours know each other on a first name basis. And that's kind of going back to the old school uh, uh, situation of, uh, of uh, community spirit and how people knew each other and, and how they cared for each other. Um, of course we know all about septic principles, the way that a place is designed and used um, has significant impact on the levels of crime in the area. And number four, which also fits into the septed uh, situation, we know that people involved in crime tend to commit their crimes where they're less likely to get caught. So they are, uh, they are um, risk managing uh, as far as um, getting caught goes. I'm sure everybody knows about septed, but let's just uh, talk about uh, some things really quickly. Um, septed principles, so you know this, the, the level one septed um, is about the avoiding hiding places, opening places up multiple accesses into visibility, so places it's easy for people to, uh, to be seen um, and can be seen through places, light and bright, and then the, uh, the next two are about the second generation, the high levels of pride in the area, the good relationships with users, owners um, and, and authority. We've done a whole lot of these projects. We started in 2008 um, and it was a kind of trial project. Um, it was highly written up and that became the funding application for every project that's uh, gone on. So 10 projects we've done. Um, I wasn't involved in the first two projects. Um, in 2010, the person who developed the initial program left and there was a bit of uh, chaos around staff for a while. Um, and so I came in in early 2011 and, and picked it up and, and run with it and improved it on every project that we do. Street selection, so what we do is we work very closely with the police, of course I'm part of the council here, um, and we work closely with the police, we work closely with Housing New Zealand, um, and we go through and we look at crime stats, we, uh, we're picking what streets we go to, we look at uh, streets where there's high police involvement, low respect of the police, um, high numbers of housing New Zealand houses, so government houses, high levels of uh, low cost housing, um, rental properties, that sort of thing. Um, there's uh, low levels of uh, care in the environment, pride, um, and there's always high levels of graffiti, and um, there are uh, 
lots of people in the area out of uh, work. So, so high levels of social dysfunction I can refer to. So, the, so you get some pictures of uh, Dick's Crescent, which is the little, little part of uh, the first one we did. And so this is the source of uh, stuff, terrible photos, sorry. Um, that this is what the street kind of looked like before we went into it. Um, closer, closer shot, terribly blurry of the two cars, of course, no, no wheels, broken windows, that sort of thing. Um, unmined lawns. This is a walkway in the street that was just constantly tagged. Um, we put a mural in that as part of the project. So the objectives really, for me, it's about uh, saying that street cleanup is the vehicle for us to achieve all these sorts of things. So we're about engagement, connection. So we're trying to engage with residents. We're trying to get residents to engage with each other. We're trying to develop a sense of ownership and pride in the area to develop, uh, establish rapport with the council police and, and, uh, and various agencies. Um, improve residents' perception of the authority, um, reduce the criminal offending, of course, increase reporting of offending. So when we're in these streets, uh, the relationships end up with uh, with people being more comfortable with talking to the police about what's happening in their street as it happens. Um, the first street that happened, the police always talk about before the project, they would hear that there'd been gang activity um, in the street two weeks ago. Now they hear about it as it's happening or as it's building up. Um, increase the social equity. Uh, um, equity in the area, establishment of neighbourhood support groups um, is a big bit for the ongoing uh, aspect of it. Uh, we're facilitating access to the community support services. We bring a whole range of uh, the therapeutic and uh, social support community with us. Um, we uh, end up, of course, with the area cleaned up. But really, you know, it's about creating connections and starting the process of building a sense of community. So what do we do? There's, there's, there's a few different aspects. There's the clean-up aspect. We turn up in the street. Uh, we're there for a week. We uh, seven days, Thursday through to a Wednesday, including the weekends. Turn up with a container full of tools. It's set up as a work a workshop. It's got lawnmowers, weeders, chainsaws, all sorts of things. We let people use tools that are, they are uh, safe to use. Um, we have a crew of uh, normally about five policemen there each day working with me. We'll have rotary, we'll have lines groups, um, all sorts of people during the weekdays. On the weekend, we have up to 100 volunteers generally from church groups. So that Saturday becomes our major um, project day, really. We uh, do a huge amount of work on that day. So we take rubbish away, green waste, we trim trees, we, we organise things to be fixed. In the video, you saw a fence being fixed, so, so I broke the deal between the uh, landowner and uh, Housing New Zealand. They didn't pay anything for labour to build the fence because we had uh, a course of some young guys that were doing building apprenticeships that come along and helped build the fence. Um, we work alongside residents to clean out property. You saw Russ Smith, the policeman, earlier on. It's about working with people, not for people. Um, and we create every opportunity we can to get neighbours to meet each other and to help each other. So we're often at somebody's property doing something, finished there, they say, where are you going now? Come with us, do you know your neighbour? You want to help out with them. So it's uh, those sorts of things. The other aspect of it is for us it's really critical that we build relationships and so we go through a very set process of pre-street meetings um, beforehand. Russell Smith, community constable and I visit every house, talk to people about what's happening. During the program we have street breakfasts where we all come together and uh, we have a chef who comes and uh, cooks an amazing breakfast for us in the street. Um, each of the weekdays during the program we have after school um, program, uh, after school program for kids. So uh, we have church groups, youth groups who are running programs from 3.30 to 5.30. It could be uh, building cool things like tanks or planes or whatever, or it could be that they're taking them on trips and doing things. At the end of it, the final Wednesday with the street party, mayor comes along and we celebrate the, the what's been achieved in the street. Um, but really for us it's about providing lots of opportunities to bring people together in the street for them to get to know each other and for them to uh, be communicating. Some pictures here of what we find. So this is the sort of stuff we find behind houses. When that was finished, that was clear. Um, this here is a picture of uh, the first project. We don't use skips anymore because skips were left overnight and ended up with a pile beside them all. This is one also where they, in the early ones, where they weren't doing recycling and stuff. So nowadays we sort all of the stuff. But, but um, piles and piles of rubbish coming out. It's a six-month program that we do um, for, for each street, so there's a range of activities, um, including the clean-up week. There's, uh, if we're near a school, we connect with the school and do community assembly where we invite uh, the whole school, invite uh, all the people from the street in and do some really cool activities. I'll show you some photos uh, later about what we do. Do the children's activities, we do come back and do follow-up activities for children and also um, clean-up follow-up 
pull up activities in the street. So, so over that six month period, there's quite a lot of stuff happening uh, on regular occasions. The outcomes, so Lucas and Dix in 2008 was the um, highly measured one. First, so they looked at the crime stats for the three years in that area beforehand, created an average for the area. First year, of course, was the 41% reduction in crime, which, which um, was the 400% return on, on uh, resources. Second year, 29, third year, and 21. Neighbourhood group support groups were set, are set up, increase in reporting of crime, and we always get a whole lot of comments from our residents about uh, that they, the way that uh, the feel of the street improves. Um, here is, I'm just going to run through some photos now and just kind of show you some things that happened. This is the last street we did in Gascoigne Street. Uh, there's two photos here which kind of, uh, you, you imagine that uh, the, um, the, the bit of the screen over here is, uh, is where the next photo will join in. So this is the final street barbecue. Um, we've got uh, a whole lot of people here joining in and having a, a, a really cool meal. We've got uh, the leader of the Salvation Army on the barbecue, we've got the regional manager from Housing New Zealand on the barbecue, and we've got the manager in Blenheim on the barbecue cooking the food. Um, Placement in the overalls here is the uh, sergeant in, in charge of the um, crime prevention unit in Marlborough. Um, so uh, we, we get really good buy-in from the police and we've got uh, good organisations turning in. Here's the other side of it, Sally Army turn up with food, Sally Army band often turns up and plays music and we have celebrations. And the suit is uh, our local mayor, um, Mayor Alistair Soman is involved heavily in the project, um, really engages. Um, I'm in the, in the hazard vest and I'm talking to the, uh, the um, Rob Dalton who's in charge of the fire service um, here in Marlborough too, so, so we get really good buy-in. This here is one of our community uh, assemblies we do at the school. Um, so we pack out the, the school hall with parents. Um, we, we, are, we are aiming at marginalised um, groups um, in New Zealand, um, Māori, um, underperforming in every important state. And so we put a huge effort into, uh, into trying to connect with, with Māori. Um, and so a kapahaka group at the school is a really good way of pulling in, pulling in a whole lot of parents. Um, so, so we often start at community assemblies with, uh, with um, cultural performances at the school. In the hall at the school we set it up like an expo, so down the, the side there we've got Matawaka which is a Māori health provider there, there with a table and giving information to people. Next is uh, health promotion and then uh, the buying grant centre, so we've got a whole lot of different community groups coming in, connecting with parents and we create ways of, uh, of ensuring that over the night people will connect with them, so we have a passport system run that people have to go around and, answer, and find out the answers to special, specific questions which mean they have to engage with the providers. They get the answers to those that go into a, a, a draw to win prizes at the end of the night. So um, we have an inter intergenerational activity at the community assembly where we get families and, and our, of uh, people working together and, and building building things. Um, so um, yeah, that's a family group working together. Um, this here shows on one of the Saturdays on the project where uh, a community group is set up. There's a, there's a church barbecue running all day because there's 100 odd uh, volunteers around plus all the residents. And so um, there's, uh, there's continuous food happening during the day and then there's groups setting up and, and giving a message about what they do. Here's the mayor um, at the end of one of our uh, children's activities. There's a river that runs through the middle of our town. And uh, on this uh, activity, we had uh, up on each day of the, the project, of the five weekdays of the project, there were up to 42 children came along to the uh, activities. They uh, threw them in vans and took them to various places. On this day, they went to the river, they built little boats, um, and they had a race floating them down the river. And the mayor stood there with the flag waving the flag, wave, wave, waving the flag at the end of it. And here he's presenting uh, the winners with, uh, with prizes. So, uh, impromptu um, um, type of wars. We're happy to grab hold of kids at any stage. There's some providers from CCS Disability Action there who are on the other end of the, the road. So we kind of just grab any opportunity that, that we can. So, And of course murals. This murals is a big part too. So this is um, a wall, privately owned wall, but we did a deal with a resident. Um, a wall that was constantly tagged and uh, tagged by some of the uh, young people that lived in the street. Uh, the young people in the street have, have helped the artists that we've commissioned to uh, help us uh, create that, that mural. 
So there's a whole range of activities that uh, we do, um, all aimed at creating engagement and creating connections. And at the end of the project, um, we always get uh, significant feedback that uh, it, it feels like we're building a, a sense of a community in the street. So, so that's me. Questions or anything? Thanks, Paul. That was fantastic. A really interesting presentation. I think we've got time for one question. If some, oh, and we do have someone with their hand up, so I'll just unmute Stan. Stan, you want to ask your question? Yes, I do. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Stan Salagaris from uh, Adelaide in South Australia. Very impressed with what you've done, Paul, in terms of uh, engaging with the community. The, the one question I've got always in these sorts of exercises is, how do you maintain uh, the sustainability of the work that you've undertaken over a period of time? And I did notice that your crime statistics um, uh, reduced over time, um, but I gather that that probably would have been um, based upon your benchmark that you started with. But clearly, what sort of things do you do to ensure that um, over a period of a number of years, what you've initiated continues on five, six or ten years afterwards? Yes, yeah, Dan, that's always the challenge and, and so that's why we've tried to do follow-ups um, and the interesting thing that happens is that people who have been involved in one project often come and help us with the next project. So um, we, uh, we remain connected um, in various ways with the people in the streets um, and so it's not uncommon now for somebody from a project in early 2000 or 2011 to, to call by my office and say, hey, such and such is happening, and then that create a conversation between me and, uh, and, and the police and, and things to happen. So, so there, is, there is still a connection. The biggest challenge is that these are streets where, where there is a lot of movement of residents as far as the rental properties go, and so, so they are the hardest ones to, to keep in the loop, really. And that we work closely. The Neighbourhood Support um, Network in Marlborough is also run by the council, with a separate, uh, separate uh, section of the council, and so we work really closely with them and uh, and help them to maintain that that part of it. Um, but certainly, from my perspective, the connection continues in a, in a different way. But uh, I can't. Blenheim's a, a relatively small town. Um, it's the biggest town in Marlborough, but, but I, I can't walk down the street in town without seeing people from streets that we've been in um, and having them stop and, and talk to me. So, so we, we do end up creating a, a real personal connection and, and we're fortunate that our community constable has been in his, in his job for 20 odd years and, and so there's the continuity there as well. Um, so yeah, but certainly that is the challenge. Great, thank you very much Paul. We'll let you go and um, I'd now like to introduce Mark Maguire from the City of Casey um, who will be our next presenter. Megan, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, all right, I'll go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, as I said, um, my name's Mark McGuire. I'm the uh, acting uh, team leader for community safety at the city of Casey, which is located on the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. Um, my presentation is, is going to be about uh, the concept of designing safer community spaces, and I'll be talking about three examples um, through the presentation, um, and then they're in line certainly with the safer design principles. Um, to design a particular space with inherently enhanced safety, it is important to consider how that space naturally functions and the interests of its intended users. Um, crime prevention, or SEPTED, as Paul was saying earlier, involves designing a space to naturally reduce the opportunity for crime and antisocial behaviour. Particularly here is a ultimate intention. Visual appeal comes second when creating the safe spaces. Um, I just want to touch on CCTV cameras here. In terms of safer design, 
for us there is a misconception out there that the cameras are the ultimate solution to all our crime problems. However, research shows that this is a misconception. Permanent cameras is more effective, has a prosecutor prosecutorial tool, tool sorry, and has little impact on increasing safety when used in isolation. While CCTV may make the community feel safer, in terms of practicality, relying simply on the cameras is a poor application of safer design. I mean, on a personal note, I don't necessarily like them and try to do everything else before I reach to, towards the camera. But um, sometimes we win some, some, well, most of the time we're winning them, and sometimes we lose them. So um, let me talk about our first one. This um, place here is called Autumn Place. It's on the, uh, it was a suburb that was established, and it's Autumn Place in Dufton, I should say. It was established back in the 50s and 60s. And most of the population that filled this space back then were um, all employed by all the industrial um, factories across the highway, which were generated Holden's, Hines, industrial, um, international harbours, so, and it was really um, uh, populated by a lot of the uh, English, Scots, Irish, Northern Irish people coming into into this space um, out of Europe. Um, and as a teenager, I frequent this space because um, we had friend, we lived in another suburb nearby, so we had our um, Irish and Scottish friends um, living in this space. So I'm quite familiar with it and um, and comfortable with it. Anyway, so. Today, Dufton is uh, an area of relatively low income, certainly low on our CIFA index, with a large number of public housing providing homes for a high proportion of the age residents, because a lot of these residents we've been talking to have been there for 40 and 50 years, so they're, they're, and they're never going to move um, from this industry, along with a growing ethnic community. Um, what you're looking at there is just the, the public toilet with a... Um, Aboriginal art that's been graffitied and we had to go through a lot of process in getting, um, even cleaning it, but you'll see that it doesn't exist anymore. Um, police presence in this particular space um, uh, was a common sight, prompting action from council to address the crime problem that was occurring there. As the park itself was located adjacent to the shops, or the strip shops, that formed a central hub for activity in Dufton. Business owners were concerned about losing, losing business due to the fear of victimisation that potential customers experience when coming to, um, to Autumn Place. Um, look, the police used to be there on, on virtually a daily basis, walking through, driving through, and eventually the uh, shop owners started to complain, asking the police to cut it back a bit, which they did. Um, because they just said that perception of couples coming through was just seemed to make it an unsafe place. So with all of that, we um, we asked Victoria Police to conduct a safety audit of the area. The conclusion that the space in autumn in autumn place was quite unsafe safe due to light poor lighting, obstructed sight lines leading to the toilets from the roads, the presence of graffiti over the toilet block and other areas. Um, un and uh, unsafe and appealing to le legitimate users. Also, this increased the capacity for other antisocial behaviours, such as drug use, assaults, to occur with little risk um, to the perpetrators. Um, next slide. So, back in, um, I think it was September two, 2012, um, in, oh no, sorry, 13, in consulting with the community about Autumn Place, we decided to do a bit of a unique approach. Um, I don't know whether people are familiar with Parking Day, and that's usually around September. Um, in, in talking with our urban design people and strategic services, landscape services, parks and gardens people, we decided to um, um, have, a, have a go at the Parking Day. This is a container you're looking at, and we've got a screen done of a typical um, lounge setting um, uh, of the 1960s. So for those who are old enough, you might look at things in there and look, oh, I remember the, the flying ducks in the back corner, etc. What you can't see is we had a, in front of it was a fence line, um, which is made up of pallets. So people actually came up to the venue, either they sat in the space, like those two people are doing, or 
they approached the fence and they talked to staff over the fence line, like you would talk with your neighbours over the back fence. So we created that sort of conversation and they would give them a cup or all those to, to, to make it a lot more friendly. So um, so it was less intimidating. So the, the was to develop a nice relaxed 1960s feel in a shipping container, Australian you know, lounge, inviting residents to sit down, have a coffee, break the social barriers very effectively, leading to some interesting and worthwhile conversations with residents about their area. And that was really what was important for us. Um, just on the container, we uh, then moved it to a, another uh, agricultural show just up the road. and. Um, it was very popular there and we got a lot more information about Dufton as well. So there was a lot of uh, unintended outcomes. We haven't tried um, another parking day, but um, it's on the agenda. We've just got to pick the right location. As you can see, so following months of planning, consulting, construction, the reopening of Orton Place was extremely well received by the community. Using safer design principles, um, the uh, old derelict toilet is gone um, and has been replaced with uh, a community stage to be able to be used by the local kindergarten schools, uh, learning centre and um, while the new toilet was in the background, you can see there's just a, a metal, grey metal box um, that just fronts the street. Um, uh, the consultation and recognition of the interest in the in the sport, uh, we also included a, um, a ping pong table. That ping pong table was is about 700 kilograms in weight. Um, the design work was done by the local uh, uh, secondary college, and so it's been there for about six months now, and it's never been tagged. Nor has any of the space been tagged or graffiti um, since the redesign. In addition, we've actually included a, a power supply. Um, so we're inviting the local learning centre to do some of their open mic sessions on Friday nights during the coming summer, and um, we're also um, we're talking to local bands, through arts and events people to come down and um, do some Friday night sessions um, as well, in relation to just create some music and sort of liven the place up even further. Um, the next site is a place called. Um, Cram Cranbourne Park in um, Cranbourne Place Park in Cranbourne. This was um, this was something that uh, was actually the worst park in our municipality. It was um, very underutilised. It had a rotunda, as you can see there, that had no lighting inside or around it. Um, had um, dips and crevices around it so people could hide or conceal themselves. Um, and uh, it also was um, also known as the Meteor Park because it was supposed to be a meteor display, which when I arrived back at Casey two and a half years ago, it had gone. So it was um, it was uh, just an unappealing space. Um, we did the same thing in far as consultation with the community. We um, we asked for an, an audit. Um, the, the space indicated natural surveillance here from houses was near impossible due to the low, due to darkness, low hanging branches and large grass mounds. Also, the presence of nearby bottle shop and fast food restaurants attracted the presence of illegitimate park users, with the evidence suggesting that the ewes were using the concealed gazebo as a makeshift clubhouse to drink alcohol and use drugs. So, like Paul was mentioning, we decided to have. Um, engage a community in a novel way of, I suppose, a series of barbecues before, during and after the redevelopment. And these gatherings are used to gauge community opinion on the park and their assessment of the safety of various times of the day. The community consultation along with the police input informed the basis of, for our plans to, to de redevelop the space in line with safer design principles and bring legitimate users back to the park. Um, one of the the other ones was um, in showing that the council had continued interest in Cranbourne Place Park, we engaged the community in planting day. And just as a side issue, we're also planning uh, a planting day at Autumn Place, my, the first um, park we talked about um, in the coming months. Um, the park's only been reopened in the past three months, so 
we just want to get the community back into that space and get ownership again. So this planting day was to encourage residents around to take responsibility for the park and develop a connection with it. This element of maintenance of a space is important and one in designing safer, print, safer designing safer sp spaces. As it is installing of an um, adequate signage around the park indicating care and legitimate ownership of a given area. If either of these elements appear to be lacking, illegitimate users take that as an invitation to use the space for their unsavoury purposes. Um, where am I up to now? Oh yes. So the, com the completed project at Cranman Place was thus far, by all accounts, been a raging success. Following the, the SEPTED redevelopment, the profile of the park has increased and has the use of the park by legitimate users during all hours. Um, I think for me it's more, I've noticed um, feedback from our, there's a small shopping strip adjacent to this park, in particular a fish and chip shop, and he says people coming to buy fish and chips and utilising the park. People on the weekends um, having picnics or there's exercise groups that he said that were never there in the past are all of a sudden invading their th in, in that space. So he's really happy about um, the improvements of the park, certainly financially as well. Um, so it's the natural surveillance capabilities and the overall park design has been improved. The park is now both perceived to be function as a safe and, and community space without the need of cameras in any capacity. Um, and this was the, uh, to add about cameras, this particular one we chose not to go down the camera line, we decided to go with the safer design principles and so there is not a camera in this space, nor is there a camera in Orton Place as well. And the Minister for Crime Prevention is, um, well he's really pleased about both spaces and often speak to us, speaks about it when he's um, at, at um, functions and presentations or conferences and saying these are two fine examples. So we set the bar high for ourselves, let alone anyone else in, in Victoria. Um, the third project and final one I want to bring to your attention is to explain how we approach safer design, the safer the design of safer community place in Berwick Village. This shopping strip through the main street of Berwick is home to hundreds of small businesses but has suffered image issues in recent times following a series of assaults leading to hysteria that crime was rampant. Consultation with business owners indicated a general belief that the permanent CCTV could solve this problem. However, Council has been hesitant to accept this as a solution. Um, Council instead conducted a safety order of the village, which was actually um, quite extensive and was broken up into about eight separate areas around the village, north and south of the, the main highway that cuts right through the middle of it. Um, in partnership with the Victoria Police, we identified certain uninviting aspects around the shops that could be improved to enhance the perception of safety. Given the evidence indicated, a large problem was not, a large problem was not really present, so it was about perception rather than anything else. One of these was this walkway that you can see right now, featuring dark footpath through the car park, surrounded by the overhanging trees and an uneven footpath. Um, there is lighting in there, but the trees were knocking it out, so, um, um, so that was our main target for this particular project. And also, um, the unevenness sort of created problems because it is an ageing population, so there was also potential for other injuries to happen at the same time. So that's what the walkway looks like now. So on a limited budget, because we had um, funding from uh, proceeds of crime through the federal federal uh, government, we are able to redevelop the space, enhance the perception safely by simply cleaning up the pathway, opening up the lines of sight, installing stairs and railings for the ageing population area. Um, these simple, sustainable, relatively cheap measures have significantly resolved the unsafe perception of the area encourage residents to shop locally in their buried village. Um, you can see lights, that, there are light poles, but there are additional lights in there that are solar ones, so, as, and they're um, motion sensors, so as you walk through it, it lights up. This is, um, this photo is about 12 months old, um, probably late winter, I think. Um, so the trees uh, are a bit taller now and a little bit greener. Um, 
like others, we um, other uh, projects, again, we engage the community and local business was essential. Building relationships with the village, within the village, allow council to generate the evidence required to approach this project appropriately. In addition to that, the business owners became more engaged with each other, opening important dialogue channels to better monitor and manage the space which they were trading in. So we're really trying to um, push back on ownership, um, taking responsibility for their space, um, as well as letting you know, letting the police know and us what was happening in their space. Um, I know we said about cameras, and sadly, um, um, despite the ongoing pressure from these businesses to install permanent cameras in the village, we managed to negotiate a compromise of six portable cameras to be managed and maintained by the Berwick Chamber of Commerce and shared and shared by the business in the village to be used for specific issues when need is identified. While I've argued that CT CCTV cameras are often mistakenly believed to be the great solution creating safe space, this is not to say that they don't have a use. CCTV is more effective as a supplementary tool for sustainable alternatives and should be implemented first, such as safer environmental design. Um, we had to, as I said, we purchased those cameras where the signs put up because we, that's part of the policy about um, cameras in open space. Um, the cameras have been with the uh, chamber for about 18 months now, and um, uh, I believe that they are occasionally used. Um, because I think that the perception is that the safety has increased around the whole village and we're still doing more work in other areas around the village as well to increase that perception of safety. Um, another point I uh, need to stress is that in order to develop a safer community space, there is a strong requirement for partnerships. It is an essential tool to form these ties with both federal and state funders for these projects. Victoria Police during the safety audits as well as evidence collecting process. Local community members, business owners, as they are the people affected the most, who will take ownership of the space after redevelopment of the project. Furthermore, it is critical that within a local government organisation that there is internal collaboration, as often community safety teams receive the least funding of all departments, Therefore, linking community safety agendas to urban planning, landscaping, capital works, um, strategic services, and a whole range of other local government departments can add value to these projects and ensure that they progress with safer design principles in mind. And that's been really one of my key roles is out there just networking and um, keeping an ear to the ground about what's happening internally as well as externally. Um, to conclude, and I don't have a, an email address or anything like that. I, that's one page I forgot to add to it, uh, Megan. So you, I think you've got my details, so you can pass it on. But to conclude, through the SEPTED design of safer community space, Casey has activated and raised the profile of many community spaces throughout the municipality. In doing this, we have reinforced our commitment to the international safe community brand and created a, a sustainable and safe areas for the community to enjoy. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. We have one person with their hand up, so I'm going to get ask Laurie to ask his question. Right. Laurie? Thanks, Megan. Um, Mark's Laurie Gabbard is from uh, Safe Communities Foundation in New Zealand. Um, the first thing yes. I want to say is that um, it is just so fantastic to hear you talk about CCTV in the way that you do that. Um, and I, I'd welcome an opportunity for you to perhaps at some stage elaborate how uh, you've engaged the community uh, to demonstrate to them how successful doing uh, safety audits and design um, are a much better way to lead towards the possibility of CCTV as a, as a target hardening um, at the very end of the spectrum. So I just I think that is fantastic and I know in New Zealand um, in my experience of working uh, with a local authority and previously in police that uh, there's a mood in New Zealand particularly with police that CCTV is the panacea when in actual fact it 
saves them getting up off their bottoms and going out and asking because they can just look at a picture. The second point that I uh, would like to make, that in, in New Zealand at the moment, a little question really, um, is that lots of uh, particularly government agencies that are in the funding business talk about a return on investment. But they also do add a little bit about um, the value to the community of certain things that doing. And when I watched some of those pictures that you had up and listened to your commentary, I wondered if you've got any thoughts around what the return on investment was for you doing what you did and the way you did it, and how, if any way, you gauged uh, the value to the community, if you like, in making that change. So if you look at a results-based accountability model and saying, well, here's a problem and here's what we did about it and who's better off, can you, could you give some sort of idea of what that might look like to you? Um, I'm just trying. I'll go back to the uh, the second park, Cranbourne Place Park. We've done an, a, a, an evaluation of the space around the residents um, some six months later, so it would have been after a summer, and um, just uh, just the general perceptions of about the place being safe to them was very high. Um, the fact that they wanted to um, use the space was also increased. Um, so they were sort of two indicators. Um, the first one, Autumn Place, is probably a bit more closer to me because that's the most recent one and because I was there as a kid. Um, the initiative was, was we're just about to um, conduct a survey, uh, evaluation survey of that space. So we're, we're targeting about 400, 400 residents around that area. Um, but the initial response was, just that perception, it feels a lot good. It feels open. It feels um, I can use the space. It feels safer. So those sorts of things. So um, I don't know whether that actually answers your question completely. Right. Well, it's, um, it's, it's an indicator. Helpful. Yeah. I, I mean, I yeah, think yeah. it's really help, helpful because when you look at the pictures, the questions you're asking, I presume, in your in your safety audit are not questions yeah. about sight lines and entrapment spots, but they're actually asking questions about how people feel. And I think that that's yeah. where we've lost the plot sometimes around SEPTED, is that we've tried to uh, run it in technical terms and not drop it down to a level that the community can understand what you're talking about. So I, w I won't yeah. take any more time up now, but um, I'll get your email address off Megan. Um, I'd love to yeah. have a further conversation with you because I think that there's there's some opportunities in there that you're talking about that could really make yes. a difference around some of the stuff that we're trying to do, particularly in the safety space. So uh, once again, thank you very much. It was a fantastic presentation. All right. Thank you. Bye. I'd just like to thank Mark and Paul for their presentations today. Um, please feel free to email the presenters or the organisers with any follow-up questions that you may have. Just a reminder, we've recorded the webinar and it'll be available early next week, so feel free to share that with your colleagues. And this is our final webinar for 2014. We encourage you to complete the survey at the end of the session or in the follow-up email, and please let us know the topics that you'll find most useful in 2015. And finally, thank you to all of you who've participated today for being part of today's webinar and for the others that we've held throughout 2014. We look forward to working with you all again in 2015 and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.